Hi. Hi. We have reached Matthew 22, verse 23. We're going to verse 33 in the NIV. That same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all the men, all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Mm. Perhaps one of the reasons they'd be astonished at this, although most Jews believed in an afterlife, unlike the Sadducees, mm -hmm. would be the choice of text that Jesus uses here. It's not the obvious one from Isaiah or Daniel about the resurrection. Yeah. He takes the text that's from the part of the Bible the Sadducees put emphasis upon. We, we don't know exactly for sure whether the Sadducees limited their canon to the Torah or just rated the Torah higher than the rest of the canon. We don't yeah. have enough information. Yeah. But we do know that they, they sought ultimate authority in the Torah. So yeah. here Christ is quoting from the Torah when he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He uses the Bible they believe in, in other yeah. words. He's, he's, he's going where he thinks he, he has has their best interest at heart because that's what they hold as very uh, important. So what what's the reasoning behind this? God's not going to boast about people that are non-existent seems yeah. to be the reasoning. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees of course didn't believe, the common people didn't believe that, that this, the patriarchs were non-existent, that there was no reward for the righteous. They mm -hmm. believed that at the very least, the, the righteous were in the bosom of Abraham or in paradise, where mm -hmm. good Jews went. Yeah. So they disagreed as to who went to paradise. Not all Jews go to there. Some some taught that. Some some mm -hmm. taught that all Jews go to a, a nice place and wait for the resurrection. Yeah. So I think for witnesses, what sense would this even make for them? You know, they'd be like the Sadducees. They they would not. They would not give any, any, uh, it wouldn't make sense for them. It wouldn't be a strong argument that God is the God of the living. You think you're dirt when you're dead. So your take on this is that what it means is that Jesus is saying God remembers the dead? Well, the, that, the good that dead. would be the witness yeah. point of view, but I don't think that then he's not a good communicator because <laughs> he doesn't use the word memory. He makes it sound like they're, in some sense, alive. Some sense. Somewhere. Yeah. Not non-existent, anyway. Yeah. And, and Luke's version of this adds that little phrase, they're all living to him. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say they're in his memory. Yeah. They're living before him or to him. So, yes, the average Jew thought there was some survival of, of uh, physical death, but that they didn't really live until the resurrection. That's they, the way they, to reconcile. they needed their body. Yeah, they're human. To be human. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, for me, the bigger point is, though, that look at the mocking attitude the Sadducees have here. If they, if they mock the most famous rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, mm. what attitude did they take to, toward their fellow governing body members? After all, the Sadducees probably were at least an equal power in the governing body, the Sanhedrin, of the of the Jewish people they were equal power at least and they actually had more secular power because they had the ear of the Romans because they were the rich class and the priestly class mm -hmm. 
The Pharisees had less secular power, but they had more power with the people because the people believe what the Pharisees believed about, among other things, life after death. So, but what the important point, if you're a witness, it seems to me, is that the governing body, the only governing body that's mentioned in the New Testament, mm -hmm. the Sanhedrin, is a divided body theologically. Can yeah. you imagine that? No. <laughs> you would never have have differing points of view within the governing body. You're not even allowed to have that among the people. But, you get a lot more people you're talking about, but you're not supposed to be divided. But you, you can see the practicality of this. That these Jews had to work together. Yeah. They had common problems and they had common yeah. enemies. Yeah. And it's better that they work together, even if they disagree, than that they scatter. Yeah. That's so a they, very practical they, they solution. They would be constantly hearing a different perspective because they were together all the time. And because they were together and they represented all of Judaism, not just Sadducees and Pharisees, but the Herodians and all the other little, little parties, mm -hmm. because they were together, they had the ear of Rome, mm -hmm. unlike today in Christendom. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here's what Ryle says. This passage describes a conversation between our Lord Jesus Christ and the Sadducees. These unhappy men, who said that there was no resurrection, attempted, like the Pharisees and Herodians, to perplex our Lord with hard questions. Like them, they hoped to entangle him in his talk and to injure his reputation among the people. Like them, they were completely baffled. Let us observe in the first place that absurd skeptical objections to Bible truths are ancient things. The Sadducees wish to show the absurdity of the doctrine of the resurrection and the life to come. They therefore came to our Lord with a story which was probably invented for the occasion. They told him that a certain woman had married seven brothers in succession who had all died and left no children. They then asked whose wife this woman would be in the next world when all rose again. The object of the question was plain and transparent. They meant, in reality, to bring the whole doctrine of resurrection into contempt. They meant to insinuate that there must needs be confusion and strife and unseemly disorder if, after death, men and women were to live again. It must never surprise us if we meet with like objections against the doctrine of Scripture, and especially against those doctrines which concern another world. There never probably will be wanting unreasonable men who will intrude into things unseen and make imaginary difficulties their excuse for unbelief. Supposed cases are one of the favorite strongholds mm. in which an unbelieving mind loves to entrench itself. Such a mind will often set up a shadow of its own imagining and fight with it as if it was a truth. Such a mind will often refuse to look at the overwhelming mass of plain evidence by which Christianity is supported and will fasten down on some single difficulty which it fancies is unanswerable. Mm. I'm reminded here that didn't we mock as Jehovah's Witnesses when we heard about the resurrection of the body from even oh, yeah. yeah. With the with the assumption that that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's disintegrated, it's in the dirt, how could that come back? But nevertheless the Word of God plainly teaches that there is a resurrection. Yeah. No, and we're dealing with God. What I didn't know then was that the early church, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and the, mm. the martyrs and apologists of the second and third centuries, dealt with this very objection that we, we took on ourselves as witnesses, thinking mm. we were smart. <laughs> no, they dealt with unbelief. The Sadducees, who mock here, also believed that. that it was a ridiculous idea that the dead come back because, after all, their atoms are, they didn't say atoms, but their pieces are all over the planet. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the unbelief always takes those kind of uh, mocking attitudes towards belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The talk and arguments of people of this character should never shake our faith for a moment. For one thing, we should remember that there must needs be deep and dark things in a religion which comes from God, and that a child may put questions from the greatest philosopher which the greatest philosopher cannot answer. For another thing, we should remember that there are countless truths in the Bible which are clear and unmistakable. Let us, let us first attend to them 
believe them and obey them. So doing, we need not doubt that many a thing now unintelligible to us will yet be made plain. So doing, we may be sure that what we know now, not what we know not now, we shall know hereafter. Let us observe in the second place what a remarkable text our Lord brings forward in proof of the reality of a life to come. He places before the Sadducees the words which God spake to Moses in the bush. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Exodus 3.6 He adds the comment, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. At the time when Moses heard these words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead and buried many years. Two centuries had passed away since Jacob, the last of the three, was carried to his tomb. And yet God spoke of them as being still his people, and of himself as being still their God. He said not, I was their God, but I am. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we are not often tempted to doubt the truth of a resurrection and a life to come, but unhappily it is easy to hold truths theoretically and yet not realize them practically. There are few of us who would not find it good to meditate on the mighty verity which our Lord here unfolds and to give it a prominent place in our thoughts. Let us settle it in our minds that the dead are, in one sense, still alive. From our eyes they have passed away, and their place knows them no more. But in the eyes of God they live, and will one day come forth from their graves to receive an everlasting sentence. There is no such thing as annihilation. The idea is a miserable delusion. The sun, moon, and stars, the solid mountains, and deep sea will one day come to nothing, but the weakest babe of the poorest man shall live forevermore in another world. May we never forget this. Happy is he who can say from his heart the words of the Nicene Creed, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Mm -hmm. Let us observe in the last place the account which our Lord gives of, of the state of men and women after the resurrection. He silences the fancied objections of the Sadducees by showing that they entirely mistook the true character of the resurrection state. They took it for granted that it must needs be a gross, carnal existence like that of mankind upon earth. Our Lord tells them that in the next world we may have a real material body and yet a body of very different constitution and different necessities from that which we now have. He speaks only of the saved, be it remembered. He omits all mention of the lost. He says, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but but are as the angels of heaven. We know but little of the life to come in heaven. Perhaps our clearest ideas of it are drawn from considering what it will not be, rather than what it will be. It is a state in which we shall hunger no more, nor thirst any more. Sickness, pain, and disease will not be known. Wasting old age and death will have no place. Marriages, births, and a constant succession of inhabitants will no more be needed. They who are once admitted into heaven shall dwell there forevermore, and to pass from negatives to positives. One thing we are told plainly, we shall be as the angels of God. Like them, we shall serve God perfectly, unhesitatingly, and unweariedly. Like them, we shall ever be in God's presence. Like them, we shall ever delight to do His will. Like them, we shall give all glory to the Lamb. These are deep things, but they are all true. Are we ready for this life? Should we enjoy it if admitted to take part in it? Is the company of God and the service of God pleasant to us now? Is the occupation of angels one in which we should delight? These are solemn questions. Our hearts must be heavenly on earth while we live. 
if we hope to be to, to go to heaven when we rise again in another world. I have to say that Ryle's comments in, in Matthew so far anyway seem to be a hybrid of the two views, the Anglican view, which after all he's an Anglican minister and bishop, mm -hmm. that heaven is our destiny. But of course the early church taught that even though we will be able to access heaven, that the saints are to rule on earth. Yeah. And, and it's funny because Ryle's other view about prophecy is that Israel will be restored and there will be a literal millennium on earth. Yeah. So I find it strange that he's always talking heaven. Yeah, although you, a lot of Christians are like that. They talk heaven, but the promise is that we will be with the Lord. Yeah. So wherever he is, is where you want to be if you love the Lord. Amen. So, you know, I'll, I'll go wherever he goes. Okay. <laughs> Follow him. <laughs> Follow the lamb wherever he goes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll put a link into it. Uh, Fenton Hort. You should know that name if you're a diligent Jehovah's Witness. He mm -hmm. gave you your New Testament. Even more than Westcott, he's responsible for our Greek text. Hort had something to say about governing body in the first century. That is the Christian version of this because it's the it's the witness version of the governing body versus the actual governing body of the first century we're addressing here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we'll put that link into Fenton Hort on the governing body concept. See you next time. Mm -hmm.